the first chapter of Robert's Rules of Order is devoted to the, the actions and how a deliberative assembly groups. So the characteristics of a deliberative assembly is a group of people determining the course of action to be taken in the name of the entire group. And the group meets in a single room or an area under equivalent conditions where everyone can hear everyone. So what this means when it translates into reality is that you can't have a, a deliberative meeting when the leadership has put everyone on mute, uh, one of the core, and in, in a conference call. Um, so in our, our Cascadia e-group, uh, where we're going to be studying this stuff virtually, everyone will be uh, on basically on a hot mic, uh, and hopefully no one is uh, eating potato chips or watching football in the background, because the idea is that everyone can hear everyone, and you can have a free and open discussion. All right, wait, wait, wait. Let's just talk about that for a second, because we're talking about doing you know modern technology here. So if the host says, okay, everybody's mic is unmuted, I'm not going to control that. However, you, as people with brains in your heads, could mute yourselves and unmute yourselves when you want to talk so that we don't hear you chewing on your chips in the background. Could you do that? Yes, you can eat chips in the background from the comfort of your bed or wherever you eat your chips, and you can put yourself on mute and then unmute yourself. Uh, but the you know the thing is, you have control over you being muted and unmuted, and whether you can speak. It's not the chair of the meeting taking a fascist control of the proceedings and squelching everyone from uh, speaking up. All right, because well, okay, because with Zoom, that it, everybody does have can have their own control. So. Just, I just what you're saying to me is that Roberts, you can do these meetings officially using a, something like Zoom, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, they they you know they ask that you authorize it because you are deviating from the concept of everyone being physically in the same room, but you know when you have people coming in from a broad area, uh, it it suddenly what you lose from being physically adjacent to each other in the room uh, is is a worthwhile trade off and. They, and in order to be able to meet at all. All right. So the, the core core the core rule is that the uh, that you have equivalent conditions where everyone can hear everyone. All right. Can hardly wait for the next meeting where uh, someone tries to put us on mute uh, and we figure out a way to bust in through that as, and raise a point of order because that's that's what it's really preventing you from doing is raising points of order and objecting to what's going on. So characteristics of a deliberate assembly on the next slide. Uh, members are free to act with the assembly according to their own judgment. Uh, opinions of each member are expressed through voting. And a failure to concur in a decision does not mean, does not constitute a withdrawal from the assembly. So just because you ended up in the minority and you voted with the minority doesn't mean that, that you're expelled from the assembly uh, because it is your right as a member to continue participating. Uh, if any members are absent, the members present act for the entire group. And this is subject to rules like quorums. So there's some fundamental rules, which hopefully your bylaws don't screw around with about prior notice to the meeting. So everyone knows that a meeting is coming up and has an opportunity to attend. Uh, and that when the meeting is held, there are sufficient numbers at the meeting to make decisions on behalf of the whole group. You don't want to have a situation where uh, a group of people call a meeting, but uh, but they exclude members so they can't participate and they make decisions. If they do that, then the decisions they make are not valid. You know, the downside of this is that there's no, you can't call up the police and <laughs> report that a meeting was held without you having prior notice because they would just laugh at you. Uh, this is the, going back to why this country exists the way it does. We are a rule of, we are governed by the rule of law and it's really a gentleman's agreement that we follow these rules uh, and that's what keeps us civil and uh, from, you know, resorting to violence uh, and working things out in a civil manner. Well, and just to point out to everybody that us not being at the meetings <laughs> is why the democracy is in the state that it is, you know, they're not going to go out of their way to let you know. It's up to us to be there and, and to be counted. You know, so. And the reason why we're where we are now at now is because for 
about the past two decades, we were quite happy with our leadership and we trusted them completely. And it turns out that we should not have trusted them as much as we did. So now we have to work hard to change the bylaws so that they, they can't get away with this shit anymore. Right? Yep. Yeah. So going to the slide on rights of a member, uh, and this is the story I alluded to earlier uh, where we had an epiphany. <laughs> so members are entitled to full participation in the proceedings, including the rights to attend meetings, make motions at the meeting, speak and debate, and vote. And the, uh, the situation that came up uh, was at, at a... Uh, a county organization which had a credentials committee that would verify whether people are members when they came in the door um, for a large county with literally hundreds of members. Uh, you can see the useful of this of this because you don't want to have people that are not members voting uh, and participating in the proceedings if they're not uh, entitled to do so. But they decided that the credentials committee would close credentialing when the meeting started. And so anyone who showed up late um, because, you know, traffic or um, they couldn't, the babysitter didn't arrive or, or they couldn't get off work early enough, they would not, they were refusing to credential anyone who showed up late. This is in direct violation of, of these rights of membership. Even if you show up late, it doesn't mean that you can be excluded from the meeting um, and your rights are being taken away from you. Uh, and so you should watch for a forthcoming uh, uh, session that we're going to have on how do you how do you push back and demand your rights. Just real quick on that, everybody, we have the entire uh, series. I don't even know how many you've plugged in there, like 10, 12 running through September and, and uh, actually even to October. Uh, so you can subscribe to that playlist on our channel. Go to uh, youtube.com forward slash uphill media and get notified when the next one event's going live because Larry's going through all this stuff. So on the next slide uh, on rights of a member, no member can be individually deprived of these basic rights of membership except through disciplinary proceedings. Or there's actually another way, but, uh, you know, no... No matter how obnoxious you are, uh, as long as, you know, and, and like bringing up the same issue time after time, as long as you're not violating the rules, you are, do, you are acting within your rights and people cannot deny you your rights just because they're tired of listening to you. Um, uh, and they have to go through a disciplinary process to deprive you of your rights. So uh, there has to, and it's, it's basically an equivalent of a trial, which is also outlined in Robert's Rules of Order about how you, you know, do the investigation and come up to a decision. Uh, and it has to be done with a majority of the membership deciding that, you no, know, you're really evil in your intent and are actually blocking the organization to the point where we need to exclude you. You cannot do that. The other way to curtail rights um, is by a vote of the majority. So there are, are so, some of these rights that are modified. So an example of this would be um, the, uh, the right to speak. And I believe I'm coming, up, I'm coming up to this later, so I will talk about that when we get to that slide. Uh, the next slide, uh, if the, you're, you have a group that's not adopted the rules, and we have a very interesting situation here where I live in Astoria, where we have a city council that uh, was established the year that Robert's, that General Robert wrote his rules of order, and they never got around to adopting anyone's rules of order. And so uh, they've documented one or two things inside the charter, but um, the rest of the rules that you find in Robert's rules of order, all 700 and some odd pages, are not valid. So you can't do things like I move that uh, we reconsider or uh, I move to table because the concept of tabling is not recognized inside the charter and it's not recognized in um, uh, uh, any rules that they've adopted. But a deliberative assembly that has not adopted any rules is commonly understood to hold itself bound by these rules and customs of general parliamentary law, which I've just gone through, to the extent that there is agreement as to what these rules and practices are. So you can see yourself being 
very exposed if you are a member of a council that has not adopted these rules. And it's really you yourself appealing to the the uh, better nature of your your uh, your fellow members uh, if you if you try to invoke some of these uh, basic concepts of parliamentary procedure when it's not it's not been agreed to. We're going to be trying to get our Astoria City Council to adopt uh, rules uh, coming up. This is the year of elections, which is a great time to be talking to candidates about what they're going to do once they're elected. And this is one of the things that we would like them to do. You mean your city council doesn't do Robert's rules now? They, Yeah, they don't follow any rules of order. How the hell do they get anything done or do they not get anything done? They don't get anything done. <laughs> the, big, the big article this past week was about the, the Safeway Hole, which is a two-block area in downtown Astoria that has uh, existed for, uh, for eight years. And the, the, the mayor uh, doesn't know how to prioritize things, doesn't know how to bring things to consensus. And basically, uh, it's now called uh, Lemire's Legacy uh, uh, because they can't decide what to do. Um, and, you know, and it, it's amazing that people are not that their hair is not on fire over this because it's they could be uh, uh, properties producing revenue you know, for the tax base. Um, they are unsightly. They could be really exciting components of the, the, the Astoria urban landscape. But right now they're just a it's just a two block hole. It's so, insane. yeah, it's I mean, this is your tax dollars. This is we could be getting things done for people and instead you have a when's their election when when does a mayor up you're gonna run for mayor uh no i'm not <laughs> and they're up um uh this coming november 6th oh, well there you go uh and hello all seven of you watching live good to have you please join the chat if you want hey phil good to see you here all right continue on larry thank you so the basic principle of decision making and uh this is on the next slide uh, is a proposition must be adopted by a majority vote. This is going back to the majority rules concept. Um, and direct approval must be registered by more than half of the members present and voting in the properly called meeting. So there's a lot of conditions here of the members present. So you don't count people that are absent in calculating the vote. And they have to be voting in order to count whether they voted for or against it. You don't count abstentions. And of a properly called meeting, and this is, means that the meeting was done with prior notice and um, a quorum existed. And more than half means more than 50%. So if a vote is taken and the vote is 10 to 10, the vote fails. It has to be 11 to 9 or more than half. Um, and you often see a... The, uh, the, the presiding officer being the deciding vote sometimes. If, if there's 20 people voting and uh, it's, a, it's not a ballot vote uh, and, and the result is, is 10 for and 10 against, the presiding officer can then cast a ballot for or against that decides whether it, it uh, uh, passes. They can actually uh, not vote and let it fail uh, if they want to do that. Just real quick, everybody, there, if you want to know more about quorums, and, and that's an interesting subject. Larry covered that in the last uh, live stream. which It's one of the, the chunks that's broken out. Just go to Uphill Media on YouTube, and you can look for that series right there. It's really interesting to learn. Um, you, can, you can set some rules around quorums, right, Larry, to, to make sure that they have enough people before they go making some decisions. Yes, and there's a default definition of a quorum and then you can modify it in the bylaws if uh if you need to yeah uh, which is we covering in the next slide so john please go to the bylaws slide 